like, woo! All right. So, all right, up next, we have a kid who fought his way to the very top. We have Ryan Schroeder talking about the underdog. underdogs, who they are, and why we love them. So when we were assigned to do an AP talk, we had to go and pick a book to do it all. And like any good high school student, I waited to the last possible minute. <laughs> so I was thinking back into what possibly I would do my talk on, and I remember that we, we had previously done TED Talks in class, and I saw one that looked pretty cool. And I found a book on it. My, project is, my presentation is not on that book, but it's based off of that. I was reading about underdogs and I thought, why do we like underdogs? Why do we always have to root for the little guy? And that's what I'm going to try to show you in this presentation. First of all, you've got to know what is an underdog. An underdog is the loser or projected loser in a competition or struggle. The, root, the word comes from English. The basic idea is that the weaker, smaller dog like this one rolls over and that's the bigger dog on top of it. Or, as you might say, humps your leg. <laughs> and doing this, it shows that it is, in this, the weaker dog becomes the underdog because the bigger dog is on top of it. <laughs> Underdogs aren't just people. They can be video game characters. They can be animals. They can even be game tokens like Monopoly's beloved thimble piece. <laughs> Seriously, though, if any of you have ever actually used that piece. <laughs> so, I have a couple of historical examples of underdogs. King Henry V led a 10,000 man army against an English army of 20,000, and he won. I mean, they're a French, but still. <laughs> And in another example that I'm sure my English teacher will love, J.K. Rowling went from being an unemployed English teacher to a multi-billionaire in less than five years. Hopefully you can do that too, Mrs. Bino. I'm sure that will make you very happy. <laughs> so, how do we view underdogs? Firstly, we like to view underdogs as the good guys. We ignore all of their flaws. We view them as nicer, smarter, and more sexually attractive. <laughs> when the team you root for wins, you get a self-confidence boost. You're more optimistic. You celebrate, you wear your team jersey, yada, yada, yada. When the team you're rooting for loses, you're pessimistic. You feel insecure. You don't advertise it. There's a reason you don't hear a lot of people cheering it. Well, never mind, I'll skip that example. I don't defend yeah. anyone. <laughs> But in spite of this, in spite of the fact that if the team you root for loses, you feel bad, people almost always root for the team that's going to lose if they're unbiased. Why is this? Why? Well, for start, it's based off of your background. Have any of you guys ever seen the film Elysium? Raise your hands if you have. Wow, really? I thought, I guess not a lot of people liked it. The basic plot of the film is that, for some reason, Earth looks like Hoodsville, it's like a dog. <laughs> and everyone wants to get off of Earth to this big fancy space station, where all it's like a... And there's this big fancy space station called Elysium where everyone wants to get to. It's like Long Island, it's all rich people mansions. <laughs> so the plot of the film is all these poor people want to get onto Elysium. Now, if you or I watch that film, we're going to be for the poor people going, trying to get on to Elysium. However, if there's someone like Donald Trump, who you see here practicing for his appearance in the next James Bond film as the rich supervillain, <laughs> he might not root for those people because he's rich. He might not want the poor people to win because he is rich. Your background, your background influences to a great extent how you view underdogs. It can even be applied to politics. Like big rich countries like England and Australia and America and Canada, we, don't, we love to watch each other win. Poor countries whose names we cannot pronounce, much less pinpoint on the map, don't really like us and they don't root for us because they view us as the overdogs and themselves as the underdogs. We don't view ourselves that way, but that's because of our background. How many of you guys were ever told at some point in your life 
that life isn't fair? Raise your hands. How many of you are happy with the fact that life's not fair? Woo! <laughs> okay, and I guess only a couple of you are. Many a couple. I don't know. <laughs> so, we like life to be fair. We want it to be fair. We want things to be fair. It's drilled into us when we're in kindergarten. Sharing is caring, yada, yada, yada. So, we root for the David, the little guy, because he's at unfair disadvantage, and we don't like it when things are unfair. The next reason we root for underdogs is a lot more pessimistic. It's called schadenfreude. It means to take pleasure in the fall and the downfall of others. It's German. It's really hard to pronounce. Schadenfreude, yeah, I didn't put it up there. Anyway. According to this theory, we don't care that the underdog wins. We want the overdog to lose. We like seeing people screw up and fail. It makes us feel better about ourselves. When someone we think is smarter than us does terrible in a test that we did great on, we feel good. It makes us feel better about ourselves. <laughs> the last theory is utilitarianism. Have any of you guys ever let a younger sibling or a cousin win a game? Like you played? Wow, harsh. Okay. <laughs> For the teachers out here that have children, have you ever let your kids beat you in a game? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the big, this is part of utilitarianism. You have the team, what you root for the team that's going to get the most out of winning. Is the team that's never won a single game going to feel better about winning, or the team that always wins? Now, I decided to do a survey because we don't take enough tests in my English class as it is, so I thought I'd make up one for everyone to take. <laughs> And the 18 students took the survey. There were 63 question, questions that measured how favorable and how sympathetic they were. There were last nine questions figured out how much they preferred underdogs. And I made graphs out of that. Before I go any further, I should talk about some flaws in my data. There was only a couple people in the test group, 18 is not a lot. There weren't a lot of underdog preference questions. And some people skipped questions or didn't understand the words or took both or maybe or yes to a multiple choice question. <laughs> I don't know why I don't think they do that on actual tests. I hope not. <laughs> now, I went and was trying to figure out the relationship between sympathy and underdog preference. If you look here, people that are down here don't like underdogs and they're not very sympathetic. People that are up here, they're saints. We're not saints. We're in the middle. <laughs> we, we like underdogs, and we are sympathetic, but we're not perfect. We're not evil either. Just saying, just because you're here doesn't mean you're bad, that's like celebrity range. <laughs> so, as you can see, there's a slight correlation between sympathy and underdog preference in this chart. I thought, hmm, this looks like an outlier, so I took it out. Then you can see that there's definitely a correlation <laughs> between underdog preference and sympathy. Now, I decided to go further. I was going to split this up and compare guys to girls. Thought it'd be cool. <laughs> for, for guys, you see that we're pretty much like the chart I just showed you. People that are less sympathetic are less favorable towards underdogs. More sympathetic, more favorable towards underdogs. With girls, it was kind of a different story. <laughs> Based on this, girls that are more favorable, girls that are more favorable towards underdogs are less sympathetic. And girls that are less sympathetic are more favorable towards underdogs. In other words, girls that are mean are like underdogs, and girls that are nicer don't like them. <laughs> I'll leave you to mumble about that among yourselves later. I don't want to get into this because I don't want to be called a sexist. <laughs> Won't have me find a date to the pub. <laughs> so, we love presuming losers. We love the group of people that are going to lose because of those reasons I just discussed Schadenfreude, utilitarianism your background. Gender might also play a role as the, that study I did showed, and sympathy is also critical. Thanks. <laughs>